Well, Jim, let's talk a little bit about AEW because we did not play any... Well, we played a little bit of media scrum audio, but we have some more, and there have actually been some requests from the listeners for you to address certain things. Oh, I wish you listeners would quit wanting me to address things because it requires me to listen to Tony Khan's voice. Well, here is apparently Tony Khan explaining the Continental Classic, the upcoming tournament, which will <laughs> lead apparently to a new Triple Crown. Let's go to this. Wait a minute, there's a big tournament coming up? With you, it was a great show, and uh, I'd love to talk more about it uh and also would love to talk in addition to full gear about the AEW continental classic uh that's something i'm very excited about and uh given the opportunity i'll gladly discuss we got a lot of really exciting things coming up it's been our biggest year ever uh in addition to the continental classic uh we've also got very exciting things like the aforementioned wembley on sale uh, really excited about AEW All In. It's really just days away that we go on sale, and it's a historic event for us. And Let me stop it right there. It's weird this year of all years saying, like, oh, we've had the best year ever, the biggest year ever, whatever he said. When we all have eyes. You know, it's like, I know you want to put a positive spin on things. You never want to be the boss out there like, you know, we're fucked. What are we going to do? <laughs> You want to have a positive spin. I mean, you're the one putting yourself in front of the assembled wrestling press. But I don't know. It sounds a little hollow like, this year. Was that a Saturday Night Live sketch, or am I just seeing it in my mind that it should have been, where the guy comes out to give a fucking statement about a, a very important matter and just go, oh, shit. Oh, God, I don't know what to do. But it was great. It was great. And the on sale of the show that we're going to have in 10 months is going to be great. Yeah, we have all these big things happening, and the biggest one's about to happen, the on sale for the event next year somewhere else. But let's go back to this. And a really big swing to try something like that again and uh, build that kind of goodwill with our UK fans that we have. And uh, also really excited, speaking of uh, the Continental Classic, about... AEW World's End, which is where the Continental Classic will culminate. And uh, we had an announcement earlier tonight about the Continental Classic uh, that I would love to address. Eddie Kingston. No one's asked him any questions about any of this. I, I wish he'd just get to I would like to know more about the fucking Continental Classic if the Continental Classic would goddamn spit it out. Does he have too many? I mean, Dusty was the guy who popularized giving names to shows. Does Tony have too many names for too many things happening? Well, yeah, that's the problem is besides the name, the championships, this, whoever, I'll, I'll spoil it because I've heard, I don't know what particular titles they are, but the winner of this tournament, the Continental Classic, will be a triple champion. Three different titles are being, everybody's got a belt. Everybody's got a belt and, and only... As we, when we did the list of them, we talked about it here on the program and went down, the viewers sent us the lists in of all the different champions. Only like a third of them are even AEW titles. The rest of them are AAA or Ring of Honor or Lucha Libre or goddamn New Japan or a belt a guy brought with him. And now he's talking about another tournament for more belts. Came to me. And as he said in his promo, and nobody could uh, say these things better than Eddie Kingston, uh, he was willing to put his money where his mouth is. He asked me about the Continental Classic, and uh, it has really piqued his interest. I think Eddie Kingston loves the Japanese style of wrestling and is a historian of pro wrestling, Japanese wrestling, and all wrestling, and uh, something that I share. And I talked about the great field, and we've announced great wrestlers already. Uh, Brian Danielson, Mark Briscoe, Andrade El Idolo, and we have a great field coming together. And Eddie Kingston asked to me about do joining what? Him and he asked him. He's not, he's been going for almost a couple to minutes do now. do what? If, it, if you're going to talk about your upcoming tournament, explain it in concept and then talk about the participants. That's kind of the order of things. And... The way you could convey the information to people who might not have seen, such as us, your fucking announcement. But he just meanders everywhere. And you he is not... This is another reason why Tony doesn't need to be the 
voice of the promotion. He's not he's not a salesman. He's not a promoter. He's not a television personality. But go ahead. It's about it. And, of course, uh, we have a very different kind of tournament. It's single elimination. It's a very different format, which is the Owen Hart Foundation Cup Tournament. And it's held uh, in the summer. It's a very different kind of tournament. And we award uh, the Owen Hart Cup winner a trophy and a championship belt. In this case, with the Continental Classic and all the excitement about it, <laughs> it got a lot of buzz. Not just because people are excited about the round robin format, but people are, got excited when we announced the first competitor in the field is Brian Danielson coming back before anybody thought it was going to be possible. How many matches before he gets hurt? It's a round robin tournament. Well, How many matches before Danielson gets hurt? But also coming back before anybody thought was possible may not always be a good thing when you're coming back from injury after injury. Is he rushing him into this thing or does Danielson, oh, it's a Japanese tournament. I got to be a part of it. Is he coming back or, before he's cleared? Well, this, these are not things that Tony is saying, are they? Well, let's get back to people are really excited about this tournament. Once again, Tony wearing the Antonio Inoki scarf <laughs> looks ridiculous. Let's go to this. I think people got excited when we've announced that there'll be nobody allowed at ringside. We're going to completely shut down uh, any interference <laughs> by all means necessary. And these are going to be straight, great wrestling matches uh, on the scoring. Let me stop it there. What do you think of that idea of having a tournament where you're guaranteed no outside interference? Well, he shot himself in the nuts again. Because all they do is outside interference and the cheap finishes and the fucking everybody beats everybody up in front of the referee, blah, blah, blah. But now he's basically said, but we can control that. We just won't do that. We won't let that happen. And so now any time that it's done in the future, you can't get any heat with it because the fans know, well, they could have prevented that. It's their own fault. So if it, you can't. There is no logic to anything in his wrestling universe. It is a ripoff or an homage or a goddamn outright steal or prostitution of everything he's ever seen from watching wrestling videos from everywhere. And all of that shit didn't fit with each other either. I'm sorry. I'm on a soapbox here. Well, let's go back to uh, the soap man or the snowman, Mr. <clears throat> Tony Cow. Every snow. I have taken something that I have found is really effective in English football and really motivates people to go for the win and fight it out and uh, will create exciting possibilities in this form. There's no outside interference in English football? I wasn't aware of that. I thought people could hit the field as long as the referees didn't see it. Matt is a little bit different from what people have seen in other round robin wrestling tournaments is three points for a win, one point for a draw. <laughs> and with three points for a win, one point for a draw, as you've seen in uh, European football, and uh, I think comparing it to what we've seen in other tournaments where two points for a win, one points for a draw, uh, it, people will be really motivated uh, to go after it, to go and chase. And uh, oh people are really excited about the Continental Classic. And when Eddie Kingston, that's twice he said people are really excited about it. I haven't heard the actual people who are excited about it. Well, but besides that, three points for a win, one point for a draw. Tony is going to sit down with his attention medicine, and he's going to book this thing, and boy, all these points and these totals, and it's going to be wild in his mind. And then several things are going to happen. Number one, somebody's going to get hurt through the course of the thing and, and throw his carefully constructed stuff into chaos. But secondly, can you imagine, Brian, even when you used to go to ECW shows, but can you imagine in any territory back in the day when you announced to the fans that there was going to be a tournament and they'd have to do math to keep up with what was going on? Yeah, that would have been rough. It would have been brutal. Go ahead. And came to me. Something he said was there's a lot of championships, a lot of trophies in wrestling. And Eddie Kingston, he called his life's work to unify the 
New Japan Strong Openweight Championship with the Ring of Honor World Championship. And it's a big deal to me as the owner of Ring of Honor that the Ring of Honor World title is unified with the New Japan title. Uh, that really means something about the relationship between the companies and also uh, adds further credibility and prestige to the Ring of Honor World Championship. Now, uh, when Eddie asked me about this tournament, he said, I'm not uh, going into this uh, as the champion and, you know, uh, reducing the credibility of these belts if i go into this as the champion whoever wins should be the new japan strong openweight champion they should be the ring of honor world champion and of course the winner of the continental classic so uh it creates something very interesting uh eddie kingston's put his money where his mouth is so eddie kingston's officially entered the field but now that's Tony's new favorite phrase, put your money where your mouth is. And, and I swear to also, if he would get to any fucking point, put a period on the end of a sentence, make a coherent, a positive fucking statement about to sell this thing rather than just meandering around about what Eddie Kingston's ideas are that we don't fully understand yet. Let's go back to this. I'm not sure if he's saying the tournament was Eddie's idea or just giving up the titles, but let's go. I don't know. I'm not sure. Now. The winner of this tournament will be not only the AEW Continental Classic winner, they will be the New Japan Strong Openweight Champion and the Ring of Honor World Champion to be the champion in three different companies, something uh, we've never seen here in America and something very exciting. And Didn't uh, Ultimo Dragon have like 10 different belts at one point when he was with WCW? He had a whole bunch, yeah. Yeah. Had uh, uh, s similar situations, I think. Uh, but the New Japan Strong Openweight Championship uh, being defended here on American soil, it creates an interesting situation. Really, the only uh, thing close to this was uh, when Kenny Omega had, of course, uh, unified championships. Even in that case. Uh, it By the way, just for the record, I mean, we've broken it up a few times. He's been going five minutes so far. Not one question. He's yeah, just answering his own question for five minutes so far. But all, but, And he hadn't answered it yet. No. The question he didn't ask. And another thing, it's so important to him, the New Japan Strong Open Weight and the Ring of Honor and this, it's fucking word salad and letter fucking Cheerios to most of the people that he might be trying to appeal to with a good quality program about AEW. He's got to fucking have all these titles in his fingers and all these companies because he's a mark. He's a basement mark. It's the worst kind. It's just meaningless titles, meaningless dream matches with meaningless interpromotional fucks that he enjoys and doesn't know that it's going to be abysmal when he puts them all together. This is why that the WWE, with the most boring programming in the history of wrestling, is drawing ten times his television audience. Because he's nerded this thing out to the point where even the goddamn... I bet half these newsletter writers are like, God damn, he's really going for the deep cuts. It's just insane. Well, let's go back to the basement. Here's Tony Khan. It, it was an international title he held. So to hold uh, championships of three different promotions here in uh, one country, it's pretty historic for whoever wins the AEW Continental Classic. It was really gutsy of Eddie to put up his uh, titles to enter the tournament, but I think it speaks to the kind of champion he is but also now we know uh whoever wins this tournament is going to come away with a very very prestigious title and it's actually not just creating more championships in wrestling it's actually consolidation but more important is cooperation <laughs> because what this triple crown means that the winner of this tournament which is going to be a great field uh that we're going to be announcing in the coming days as we approach Wednesday the night field that Tony is standing out in the middle of. That's what the field is. And, it, and yes, this is a this is a tournament where the winner is going to end up being the champion of the tournament, the Continental Classic. Well, imagine that. Every tournament winner is the champion of the tournament, but it's not a fucking title. Uh, they're also going to have a world title from a secondary company that I own and put on YouTube. And they're also going to have a secondary title from a Japanese company who's trying to promote in America and puts their strong, open weight belt on people that fucking live here so they don't have to fly them. What the fuck is this? It's Nobody knows these things. 
except this small minority of even the AEW audience that are apparently able to keep up with this stuff, this minute minutia of everything going on in these small or barely existing promotions or ones around the world. And that's why he's not paying any attention to the shit that AEW is in. And it's going to be a big test, too, for all the fans that for all these years said, oh, I wish there were one of these champion carnival-type tournaments here in the States or G1. Now we're going to see how it really goes on TV, and if the general fan is interested in it, and this point system, which is better because it's three points, not two points, let's go back to Tony. Maybe he'll answer it. It's going to be creating a championship that's very prestigious and a champion that represents three different companies on American soil and three different companies worldwide. So I'm really excited about that. And uh, now I can start taking questions, uh, but just wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit more information about the Continental Classic. Does he enjoy too much the idea of playing the role of promoter? I don't just mean by like, he's a rich kid promoting, but he's talking in kayfabe. You know, this conversation, I had a conversation with Eddie and he said, I need the best, whatever he just talked about. Yeah, yeah. He's talking in kayfabe. He's trying to get the story over in kayfabe. Does he enjoy this too much? He just he just yes. for six minutes, by the way. Well, he's out there for two hours. Whether it's the talent talking or not, he's sitting right next to him so he can smile and nod. He I enjoys the attention because this is his dream to have done this. We've gone over this many times. He loves talking to the fans. He loves talking to the reporters. He loves telling them about all the great things that his live action figures are going to be doing and all of the minute championships and all this fucking intricate stuff that in his mind all fits together perfectly. And he gets an opportunity to play with all these other different rich kids that own their sets of live action figures around the world. And it's, this is why that he is appealing to a smaller and smaller group of people because as they get farther into the we nerd weeds and farther into the ridiculousness of the whole idea of the meaningless matches, the multiple titles, the constant tournaments, the multiple man bullshit, as well as the injury rate that he's got because these guys are marks for their own shit and there's nobody to tell them no. This is what's happening. And they can't deny it. They're, they're in 22,000 seat buildings with 2,200 fucking people. They're not only filling a tenth of the building, they're getting drubbed by 10 times in TV ratings. And he can't figure it out yet. This is bad indie wrestling on national television with mostly bad indie wrestlers doing it. And it don't fly. Well, let's go back to Mr. Fly, Tony Khan. We do. We have to? Yes. The winner of the tournament will be the Ring of Honor World Champion. They will be, and New Japan has cleared this, that Eddie is their champion, and New Japan is aware, and that the winner of the AEW Continental Classic will be the New Japan Strong Openweight Champion. They'll be the Ring of Honor World Champion, and they will be the AEW Continental Champion. So we are unifying all three titles. No, it will be a triple crown. And forming a triple crown of uh, three titles, it'll be the Ring of Honor World title, the New Japan Strong Openweight title, <laughs> and this tournament. And what's really great is uh, I think we found something here. There's a lot of excitement about the Continental Classic. So uh, it creates a, a venue. No so excitement. what I'm excited about is that the winner of this tournament will go out and defend the championships throughout the year, and whoever at this time next year is the champion will have another huge field to participate in. And we have a lot of excitement about uh, this and people clamoring to enter. And in the coming clamor, days, clamor, I believe clamor, you'll clamor. see a lot of the most exciting young stars and some of the top stars in AEW all are lining up for this opportunity. And uh, it is an exciting opportunity because – uh, people ask what the Continental Classic, what does it represent? Well, it represents something very important, a competition in AEW against uh, other top stars, but also something more prestigious because for the champion of two other companies to step in and say, I want to be in this competition and uh, 
if I'm in this competition and I don't win it, then whoever wins wait, wait, should wait. be. Wait, 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 stop, stop, stop. The champion of two other companies, that doesn't even make sense. Ring of Honor is a company he owns, right? And well, yeah. Eddie Kingston is under contract to AEW, even though he also is the New Japan strong openweight champion, which is, again, a secondary title in New Japan. And the Continental Champion is a championship that they're making up with it. So there's nobody in any different companies that is going to be represented here and besides that now they're going to have a continental title and they've already got an international title does that mean if they were to unify those it would be the intercontinental title that's a good question the former all-atlantic championship is the uh international championship yes because they figured out that they misfigured where the atlantic ocean was and a lot of people got lost if it is the continental championship does that mean it doesn't leave the continent I think that's that's correct, right? Either that or, you know, it can only be defended on one continent. What if you're the size of a continent, like a big fat guy? Well, in that case, then you ought to be able to, to either be continental or incontinent, depending on which one you so choose. All right, well, let's go back to Mr. Incontinent, Tony Khan. The champion of the companies I'm the champion of, and in this case, uh, the winner of this will unify uh, three different promotions championships, which has been a novel idea when uh, we've seen it before. And frankly, uh, has been a novel interest, idea course, when we've seen it before. It's deja vu all over again. <laughs> collected belts. And at one point, I think had built a, a very impressive collection of championship belts of different promotions. And uh, in all Japan pro wrestling, you have different championship belts, uh, the PWF and uh, uh, the NWA United National and different promotions. Does it, I'm just so I named two of them. Does anybody know what the third belt in the All Japan Triple Crown is? Besides maybe Jim, and even if, or does even Jim? Jim, can you tell me? Oh, is he talking to me? He's talking to are you. you. Are you talking to me? He's talking to you, Jim. It actually it was the PWF title, right? Right. And he just mentioned that. And the, what was the other one? You know, it was the all Asian. And then was it the international? Hold on. Now I have to look it up. Although I guess he's about to say it, but all, I don't know. He was reaching for those first two. The all Japan triple crown championship is a combination of the PWF world heavyweight championship. The NWA. Yeah, I was right. The international heavyweight championship and the NWA United national championship. United National title. That's what it was. Let's go back to uh, <sighs> Tony Antonio Kanoki, as you put it the other day. Do you have another third belt in the All Japan? Okay. Then, uh, so, so, so you get, so again, like the All Japan Triple Crown, I feel like it's been around for so long that people, and I'm in a room full of wrestling media, and uh, that does to some point, I think, the identity of the Triple Crown consumed each of the individual titles please thank you thank you and uh the international so there right, i don't know what's going on let's we got to somehow get to another question He's been well throwing... I, I don't we don't need to get to another question well uh, but here's the thing also that i'm afraid tony since he wasn't alive at that point he studied all these things through tape and the internet the PWF title was the Pacific Wrestling Federation. That was Baba's the version of the NWA or WCW or the governing body, right, for many years. The United National title had been established, and I can't remember the entire roots of it, but for a number of years. And did that, did that title even come from another promotion that they absorbed at one point or absorbed the champion, like the IWE when they got Russia Kimura? Uh, and then the they, all of those championships, the NWA international title had been defended and been around since the 60s, I believe, had it not, on an ongoing but not every week basis. The titles were established. They'd had many different stars hold them, and there'd been many different defenses before they got the idea to put them to, up for grabs in the Champion Carnival Tournament, right? You're the Japanese expert. 
I don't remember if it was up in the Champions Carnival tournament. Or what, the first however, the, however, they unified it. They unified it originally that way. Yeah. Yes. So point being, he's got one his secondary company's title. A, a Japanese company's secondary title and one, a new one that they're making from scratch to give to the winner of this tournament. It's not the same thing as having like 15 or 20 years of history of all this shit and then uniting it. He's missing the points of these things. Some of these things are great things to do, but not in the time or place or context that he does them or with the people he does them with. It's He's doing everything. What do the kids call it? Spamming? When you just hold your finger down on the goddamn button or whatever, he's just holding his finger on a fucking button. And he's pushing all my buttons today. Well, one more little bit of audio, because Jason quoted this. Apparently, this is in the middle of Tony giving an answer about what he would want to do differently in 2024 and better in 2024 for AEW. Ever done, and I felt like we did. We had some incredible matches that were on a level beyond anything we've ever done when we come to LA. And that was my goal to like set a new bar here. And we did. And we had the Texas death match, which to me was one of the most incredible matches <sighs> ever in AEW. And I, and I'm biased, but I thought it was one of the greatest matches I've ever seen. <laughs> and, and then, uh, that is the ultimate high bar. And going into that, there'd already been so much great stuff on the card. And Orange Cassidy was here. I thought Orange Cassidy uh, <laughs> was just incredible in the John Moxley match. Those guys tore the house down. And uh, Julia Hart was here. I thought Julia Hart, Chris Statlander, and Sky Blue was a great match. The latter match, those guys were in here. They were great. And then the every match was great. It was great. We were all great. And by the Fine way, the, the fact that uh, hold on, the oh, fact sorry. the fact that this fucking guy. He's the boss, and he thought that Texas death match was just one of the greatest things he's ever seen. That's why they're fucked. That's why they've been fucked since the start, and that's why I knew the first time I spoke to Mr. Tony that this was going to be a goddamn fiasco because of that kind of Mark viewpoint. Young Bucks and Jericho and Omega were able to really uh, keep the crowd going after they'd seen so much stuff in the Texas death match, but then at the end of the show, knowing that the crowd has seen so much, it was a testament. I thought to MJF and Jay white and how much people wanted to see where the story turned that the crowd was really on the edge of their seat for the entire last match. And it was different. And I think if people want to see the sports-based presentation in every match there's 33 <laughs> matches in the continental classic so get ready strap in get ready every wednesday and saturday the same people who don't want to see any outside interference wait did he say there's seriously. 33 fucking matches in the tournament did he say 33 matches or 33 competitors i think he said 33 matches hold on i'll go back a little bit let's hear it again presentation in every match there's 33 matches in the continental classic so get ready strap in get ready every wednesday and saturday the same people who don't want to see any outside interference i'm not bullshitting i'm dead serious if you don't want to see any outside interference if you want to see straight wrestling at its very best in a great field at, then put your money where your fucking mouth is and wednesdays and saturdays i expect to see you uh strapped in <laughs> Because wow. we are going to put on the best wrestling tournament with some of the best matches. And the problem is he still doesn't understand the problem is him. And it's always going to be him. And he loves doing this. He's not great at it. And he's thinking like a fringe fan. I could say that as a longtime fringe fan. He's thinking like a fringe fan. I, no, <sighs> Brian, if you're the fringe, then he's out past Pluto. Because uh, you know better than he does what the fuck is going on here. Apparently, most people do, but they can't tell him. Well, we have 33 matches uh, on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Is that going to, okay, is that going to be just all of the TV show is going to be these tournament matches? Or are they going to have tournament matches and other regular television content? So... So they're going to have to tell the story that now this is a tournament match, so nobody can interfere. But the next match is just one of our regular fucked up matches, so people are going to come down and fuck goats in front of your very eyes and interfere at their heart's content. That is going to be interesting. How do they go from one segment to the next if one is just pure purity? I guess not even because, pure anything. Yes, purity. When, 
<laughs> when has there not been interference in any goddamn AEW television match that wasn't a complete squash? Ever. Even the Texas Death Match had interference. Yes. So now they're going to go, okay, now remember, this is a tournament match, so we have padlocked the locker rooms. It's not possible for anybody to come down and interfere. How's that going to work? The bigger question is, what is sports-based wrestling, and what is a sports-based presentation? And this is something we were teased with in the early days of AEW, and it's something a lot of fans like me wanted. My idea of sports-based wrestling isn't, here's two competitors, they're both in black trunks, they're now going to grapple, and the best man will win, and then they're going to shake hands. My idea is Mid-South Wrestling, where you don't talk down to your audience, and no matter what happens, you put it in a reasonable context so it makes sense. You don't talk it's, down to your audience. There's no condescending. If if something, if you have a great idea, but it can't possibly really happen, don't fucking do it. And and make your fans believe in, in the personalities of your talent roster, whether positive or negative, so that they will have a strong vested interest in seeing who wins and what's going to go on. And make the work look good so it doesn't look like phony bullshit or like children fucking performing it. That's sports-based presentation. Does he think that swerve and dipshit was sports-based when they were not only using obviously fake props but cooperating with each other to do stupid shit that nobody would ever do in real life? Well, I think that's one of the things for sports-based wrestling that fans who want it want is nothing... That is ridiculous. Just make everything reasonable. Everything has to make sense. Not say, I want angles. I want promos. I want good heels. I don't just want these guys are going to go in there and work their wrist for 20 minutes. That doesn't appeal to me. There is something in between. It's not just, we're going to give them Swerve Hangman, or we're going to give them, you know, we were you and Daniel Garcia out there grappling with each other. There's or something the, or in then, between. And, and, and keep, the, keep the guys off the trampoline. It's either cheerleading routines, garbage blood wrestling, or, you know, completely ridiculous, preposterous comedy scenarios. None of that is sports-based presentation of pro wrestling. Maybe the uneven parallel bars, but not pro wrestling. But, but did he ever know to begin with what that meant when he was saying it? Or is this what he thought it meant? I don't know, because again, Cody was saying it early on. And I think Cody had, even though it wasn't perfect, Cody's idea of sports-based wrestling was probably more in line with what I want than what others sports want. Sports-based wrestling. Yeah, with wrestling. It's wrestling from the 80s or any time before it where you didn't, where you pretended like everything was real. Treat everything like it's real all the time. Tony's trying to do it here during a media scrum, but he's ridiculous. <laughs> and he just talks. Bill Watts never did a seven-minute monologue about a tournament. <laughs> He was able to sum it up pretty quickly. Reeser Bowden could do seven minutes on it. Reeser Bowden could say hello for seven minutes. But that's the thing. Sports-based wrestling doesn't just mean like professional grappling. It doesn't just mean like the UFC, but in a ring. Isn't that what the, that these idiot fans that don't know anything about the history of wrestling and just suck at the teat of these fucking children think that we used to do in the old... Well, he wants the 15-minute headlocks. No, no, we don't. And we didn't have, well, every once in a while, you might've had a 15 minute headlock and that was either the territory or the town was on its ass or somebody was about to get fucking fired. But otherwise, for fuck's sake, it's so, it's so dry. You got to watch it in the rain. Well, I don't know how much more Tony Khan audio I could play. So we're going to stop. I don't know there. how much more I can take. So well, yeah. Which adult said, put your money where your mouth is. And now that's become his favorite phrase. He saw it on TV, I bet you. All right, well, we'll see if he puts his money where his mouth is with his great sports-based 33 match tournament <laughs> coming up here, Jim. You think everybody's going to be taking notes on their pad that they keep next to their television at home on the results and the points so that they can see who the leaders are and extrapolate and speculate and fornicate on who the winners might be before it happens and get all ex because they're all excited we heard that well you know in japan where it's a very different culture wrestling was in the daily newspapers and the weekly publications had high circulation 
so that those fans, when there was a tournament happening, right, you could follow along with who has how many points, who won what match where. Again, they were wrestling a full schedule as opposed to two nights a week, everything being TV. So it's a different thing altogether. And, and again, these tournaments had years and years of, of history of the competitors involved were all main event talents and all known to the public and the tournament got established to where people knew and understood what was going on. And as you mentioned, Japan is a very different culture. Also, from what I remember uh, when I paid attention, the tournaments always worked out to where that it was a nail biter at the end with two or three different uh, contenders having the ability to win with their points the way that they had them or whatever the fuck. How the fuck is Tony going to keep, even if he figures it out ahead of time, then when people start saying, no, I shouldn't do a job here or I, he ought to beat that other guy or whatever. It's going to get all fucked up. And it's going to be one of those old fucking bad territory tournaments where guys were in the second round without having won anything and other guys got eliminated twice because they couldn't keep their shit straight. Well, we shall see at least on Wednesdays. I don't know how much uh, we're going to be seeing on Saturdays, but that's Tony. Well, Com we'll wait for the reports in the newspapers. That's Tony Com at the media scrum. As you uh, mentioned the other day, MJF was crying at the start of it. We'll see what else happens there. The word is uh, that he may have hurt his hip. And how could he have not? How I was about to say, how in the, I don't know how he stood back up and walked. Let alone after that is when he did that dive over the rope into the cutter on the floor. Well, yeah, but that, you know, that was on the, uh, no, it was on the same hip, come to think of it, because he was going the opposite direction. So, yeah, he, he landed on his left hip both times. Ah. <sighs>